All right, folks, another big show today. We are going to talk about the building industry and everything within that. We're going to chat about, is it a good time to build or renovate right now? And we're also going to ask the question, what should you ask your building inspector when they're doing that inspection for you? But Ben, what else are we going to cover? Mate, we're also trying to solve this big problem, this building crisis that we've got. So we're going to try and tackle those big questions and also material and labour shortages what's going to happen in that particular space. A huge show, Bros. Huge show, lots to cover. And we've got a very special guest on. So let's rip into the show. Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel. Co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory, Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, mate, welcome back to another show. How have you been this week? Oh, mate, I've been well. The girls had a win on the weekend, so we continue to fight through in the finals. So go the pies. Uh, it's always good to have a bit of footy around in the background. It I love is. it. I think they got the timing right too on the season, don't you think? Just to because yeah. um, uh, then there's no competing. They're building, they're building a brand. They're building yep. interest. They're building crowds. I think it's. Uh, I think the timing was smart. So yeah, um, I don't disagree. So I know I've been checking them out. Um, when I've had time to, you know, have a look at the game. So I caught the game on Sunday there, Sunday afternoon. So nice. it was good. Yeah, well done. Well, good, good mention there. Hey, um, you've got an upcoming AGM uh, picker. Um, yeah, put my picker for- hat on, the annual AGM, obviously, um, where we sort of outline basically what we've been up to for the year. We've had obviously a big win when it comes to Queensland land tax. So that is on. Um, so put it in your diaries for uh, Tuesday, the 22nd of November, 5 p.m. Now, if you're a paid up member, um, that information would have gone out to you along with the notice of the AGM and also the proxy form. So if you haven't filled out the proxy form with your votes, we need to get those votes back in um, to uh, to obviously do our compliance piece. And um, Kieran um, Clare is uh, basically coming up for re-election as am I, um, as part of our constitution. So those things are really important because we need to get a minimum of 3%. Mm. Um, to to uh, establish a quorum, which allows us to to be obviously uh, on the right side of of ASIC. So from that point of view, um, that's coming up. Oh, well done to you guys too. That's all volunteer based, so uh, doing a, a terrific job um, uh, with a couple of couple of wins along the way, Ben. But it sounds like um, uh, Queensland has another one on the horizon for more you. More work so. to do. More <laughs> work to do. Always more work to do. Compliance stuff. Uh, now it's councils trying to charge us more for uh, for basically being investors. It's ridiculous. So yeah. yes, yeah, so there's plenty. There's plenty of uh, of lobbying that we need to do to make sure that that property investors aren't treated like a uh, an ATM machine. ATM for the states, to quote Antonio Mercarella. So there we go. Um, we got a very special guest today, Ben, um, on a topic that I think is relevant on anyone who's interested in property and the building industry in general. So it's going to be. A ripper. Uh, so we'll introduce our guest shortly. But before we get there, uh, my mindset minute theme today. Stumbled across this uh, this ad, Ben. You can see it in the show notes, but I'm going to describe it. It's basically an ad for a uh, a London based investment management company founded uh, in 2010 by Terry Smith, and it's basically a very simple ad that says Fundsmith, the name of uh, of the investment manager. <laughs> very company. creative. And it's underneath. It just says three lines. Buy good companies, don't overpay, do nothing. And I just thought that's that's good, right? Um, so what would so it made me think what what would be the TPC variation for that, Ben? Well, I think it would be something like this: uh, buy investment grade properties, don't overpay, do nothing. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of just um, getting everyone into the mindset that time horizon needs mm. to be um, uh, decades, not years, and um, the essential part is uh, don't tinker with it. Um, get it going. So I, I thought it was interesting, Ben. I thought you'd find it interesting too. And I guess um, for our listeners, it's a reinforce of a mindset that we're talking about that um, it's all about holding for the long term and letting time do the work here. Yeah. Well, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking more about that really longer term play and looking at some of the 
the data. So we're, we're building a, a framework on that. So I'm looking forward to, to getting to that final show before we go into summer series. Summer series, exactly. So you, um, that has been building for some time, Ben. So the anticipation, <laughs> you've, we've just dropped it there. So we're... Uh, so it's uh, going, it's happening. <laughs> we've, we've locked it in now, so which is good. Ben, you and I recently had a conversation uh, with Paul Baker regarding the building industry, some of the challenges and pitfalls there, but also some of the opportunities. And it was a really good conversation. Uh, looking forward to sharing it with our community. So let's cut now to the conversation that you and I had with Paul Baker. All right, man, we've got a very special guest today. Normally I do the intros here, but um, mate, you've uh, you've strong-armed me and said you're going to do this, so you should take well, it over I'm, from me. I'm going to have a go. I might yeah. as well have a go. And the reason for that is because Paul Baker is not only, you know, an expert in his area of expertise, but um, he's also a great mate of mine. And a um, little backstory there. Now, so Paul's a, re- a return guest. Yes. Um, but he's also a great mate, but he also helped build uh, three of the renovations that we've done on our home. So he's a, obviously a licensed builder. He's also a licensed pest inspector and building inspector as well. So um, let me just uh, make the formal introductions to the community. So Paul Baker is the director of, of Inside Out Property Inspections. He's a qualified carpenter and registered builder practitioner with the Victorian Building Authority. He also is a pest inspector license, which I just mentioned earlier, and experienced residential home overall inspector. So he's an expert in his field. Um, he, as I said, he's a great mate. And the reason why we've got Paul back on the show is because we got a bit of feedback recently from our community about um, what's happening out there. And we've met, we've been talking about this, um, haven't we, Bryce, in terms of We've obviously seen some builders going broke. We've seen, uh, you know, I've mentioned on the economic and RBA updates about the the cost of building that's gone up as well. So why not grab someone who's in the field out there mm. every day? Now, remember, bearing in mind that Paul's Melbourne based, so ultimately he can only talk to the Melbourne story that he's seeing out there. But what we want to do is is rather than just think about the theory, let's get the practical, uh, f- uh, you know, sort of feeling of what's happening in the ground. So welcome, Paul, to the show. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good to have you back. How, how do you go with the intro, do you reckon, Paul? Well, I thought he was done pretty well. He pumped me up a bit. I'm a bit worried that I'm not going to be able to live up to all those, uh, all those expectations. I was wondering when he was going to introduce you. So at least we, at least we got there in the end. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thanks for the critique. Uh, we'll take that offline. I'll, I'll see if I can do better next time. Hey, <laughs> hey, Bakes, I want to start with um, a conversation that that is really around what are you seeing out there? What has changed in the last 12 months? Because if we think back to 12 months ago, the property markets around really the country were booming at this point in time. And here we are now where there's obviously uh, challenges in all aspects. So tell us what you're seeing out there when it comes to the actual building side of it. And you know what, what are the things that's showing up for you? Um, I guess the big thing is um, coming out of lockdown and with everything that's been happening globally, you know, with the war in the Ukraine and all that sort of stuff. Um, The building industry has faced some real challenges with, um, you know, supply chain issues and um, the cost of materials and, um, you know, even just being able to get materials has been really tough for a lot of builders. Um, We've had issues with um, staff shortages, you know, skilled migrants coming into, not coming into the country during that COVID period. Um, Even down to, you know, backpackers traveling around, you know, we, we used to use those for builders, laborers, you know, we'd pay them $25 or $30 an hour as a builder's labourer, but we can't get those sort of staff at the moment. And, um, you know, we've, we've got fully qualified tradespeople digging holes and unloading trucks and, um, you know, doing jobs at, you know, 55 60 bucks an hour rather than $25 or $30 an hour. So, you know, it's 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 been really hard in the building industry and um, certainly for, for builders that entered into fixed price contracts before all these escalations happened, you know, they're, they're doing it really tough as long as well as the consumer, the consumer is doing it really tough as well. Yeah. Cause it's, a, it's a, it's a reasonable perfect storm that you talked about there, right? You got um, raw material increases. Like you say, there's no one to actually do the work. Um, you can't get the stuff in quick enough to, if, if let's just say that people could afford to pay for the materials and someone was there to build it. If it, if it doesn't turn up, that puts delays and pressures on everyone. And yeah, um, I guess the biggest sometimes hidden part is just the mental health challenges for people that are going on in the industry, particularly people who are taking on enormous amounts of risk um, at a at a directorship level for the building companies. But but even the 
the poor old person who's building the house. You know, they're going through that anxiety of when and all the holding costs that are coming. So it's it's kind of like this this melting pot of perfect storm and also uh, mental health challenges that are thrown in as well. It's um it must be tough on the ground. Yeah, it's and it's um we'll talk about the the consumers or the clients in a bit, but from a builder's perspective, it, it's actually really tough. Um, you know, with those price escalations, if you're on a fixed price contract, you can't necessarily go back to the client and ask for more money. You know, the contracts, um, the client's gone into that contract with an understanding that this is what it's going to cost. And, you know, they may, have, a lot of times when um, people do build houses or do large scale renovations and extensions, they put everything into it. You know, they might go out on a limb and borrow as much as they can from the bank to, to get this job done. And it's their their passion and, you know, their the biggest investment in life and um you know if it's a three or a four hundred thousand dollar job and the, the builder comes back and he's wanting another 50 grand a lot of people just can't go back to the bank and get that money and, and it's and it's not right either you know like they've entered into that contract in good faith so from the builder's perspective they're in a lot of times having to wear that cost or they're going into bankruptcy which creates all sorts of issues so you know um the stresses that that puts on the builder um, is unbelievable. And, you know, I know, um, you know, when things are, are happening and you go home and you lie in bed and you start to think about the day and you're trying to go to sleep and things start to, you know, build up and, you know, you start to worry about what you need to do the next day and how you're going to pay for it. And you don't get a good night's sleep and then you get up and you go to work the next day and the pressure builds and then you go home and, you know, there's pressure in the family. It's, it is a really tough time. And, you know, from, you know, from a mental health issue, it, it's put, certainly putting a lot of stress on it. And it's not just the builders, it's all the subcontractors underneath that builder as well. So it's, you know, your bricklayers and your plasterers and your electricians and your plumbers and your painters and, you know, all the people that go into building a house. If a builder goes broke, it's not just the builder that suffers, it's all those other trades that aren't being paid down the line. You know, they've got families and children to feed and, children to educate and you know it's 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 a really tough time can you do a little 101 for people listening to this you know in terms of um fixed price building contracts um cost plus building contracts what what sort of ratios are you seeing in the marketplace of people who are typically doing fixed price and i know you it's a rule of thumb but yep. what what sort of what sort of rough percentage are we experiencing uh, fixed uh, price so cost? There's, there's um the majority of renovations or buildings that you do are um, fixed price to do a cost plus um, contract so essentially what a, a fixed price contract is is you um, supply a, a tender document or a, a set of plans to a builder and they'll go through and they will quote that that project and that project more than likely will have exclusions based on the the client's budget so it might not include you know landscaping or fences or something like that they'll they'll leave that off because the client will look after that. But there's always areas where the price will increase. So for example, if they're doing excavations and they find rock in the ground, well, the builder can't necessarily know that that's going to be the case. So that that is actually going to be added to the cost of a fixed price contract. So even though you sign a contract for X amount, you do need to have some contingency for things that, that um, aren't within the builder's control or any variations that are made during the during the project. So the majority of sort of renovations and extensions and, and new builds are done with a fixed price contract. Now, a cost plus contract is where you sit down with the builder and the builder does an estimate on the on the works. And um, what happens is um, you negotiate and it, it'll be a margin that the builder, um, you know, you negotiate with the builder and it might be 10% or 15% or 20%, whatever the builder's margin is. Um, and so you actually pay for the cost of the build and the materials plus the builder's margin. But there's some really strict rules around when you're allowed to enter into a cost plus contract. So you can't just do a normal renovation or a, or a you know, a build, you know, a, a standard sort of build on a cost plus contract. You know, you, um, the whole idea is that we're trying to protect the consumer, like the, the build needs to be over a million dollars and there needs to be reasons why the builder can't actually quote that job. So you know, materials that are being imported from, you know, tiles that are being imported from Italy and the builder doesn't have the cost of those or, you know, um, things that are architecturally designed and they're still sort of working through what those materials are going to be. They're the types of reasons why 
you would enter into a cost plus contract. And just building on that too, Paul, obviously the other party is that if a bank's going to be lending money, um, they want to have an assurity that the cost um, that they're estimating doesn't blow out because ultimately what they don't want is to have possession of a property where the, the the loan balance is greater than the actual recovery price, meaning that if something does go wrong, um, there's not a you know a five hundred thousand dollar loan against the property that's worth four hundred eighty thousand dollars because they won't get their money back. So yeah. we have seen obviously um, the building trade ask the question around you know where they could go to cost plus because of this you know unfortunate perfect storm that we're dealing with. Because don't forget we also obviously had the incentives coming into uh, COVID or coming just out of COVID where we had all of this government, federal government stimulus around getting all of these people to buy and do these renovations. So we had this massive demand wave coming through just as all of the supply wave dropped off and then the labour shortages. So it's it's pretty, it's pretty shocking out there, but that sort of rounds off that term. Um, in terms of, have you noticed any changes? I mean, we're hearing reports about um, cost of material starting to come down um, we're starting to see some of those supply bottlenecks um, in terms of shipping costs and all that start to come down. Are we starting to see some of those materials such as timber and and you know uh, piping and all of those bricks and so forth? Are they coming down yet? Um, to to some degree, but I, I don't know that they'll ever return to what they were two years ago. Like. Um, you don't really see prices come down once they go up in, in general in, in life. Yeah. Um, but the, the difference between now and a couple of years ago is the builders or the estimators that are estimating these projects, uh, there's a lot more clarity in the industry about where the pricing is. So if you're entering into a contract now with a builder, um, I reckon you've got a lot more assurance that there's not going to be those um you know that that scary component about you know, yep. you know um, materials not being available and and um, crazy blowout. So builders and and estimators have been working really hard to get that pricing right. So when they price jobs, firstly they're not going to lose money. They're actually they're in business. They're in business to make money. Um, but then from the consumer's point of view, what what you're being quoted, the house is going to be built for outside those variations and uncontrollable changes. So. I think that's the, the difference over the last couple of years is we're we're starting to understand the landscape of of what we're dealing with from a from a pricing perspective. And yes, things are more expensive. That's just unfortunately the nature of the beast. But if you're entering into a contract now, there should be some some reassurance that um, the pricing they've got the pricing right. But who knows? Like this war in the Ukraine, like you yeah. need a crystal ball. But um, certainly the difficulties that we had a couple of years ago with with those crazy escalations in a short period of time, all those builders and those those clients, um, you know, they're, they're doing it tough and they're, and they're still doing it tough. Now, Paul, in, in economic terms, when we talk about demand curve and demand, you know, the, the law of demand, we have a what's called a substitution effect. So in other words, when something gets so expensive, then people look for substitutions. Have you been seeing any evidence that people are looking for different types of building materials that may... Um, be cheaper or even any um, any sort of themes coming through about modular builds where they're, they're sort of being built in factories to try and keep costs down because they're doing them in volume. Are, do you see that there might be a trend towards trying to look at alternative materials because the cost of the existing materials that we're using uh, is going up? Yeah, um, oh. I'm not sure about the module homes. I do know a couple of companies that um, that build them, and they always seem to be busy. Um, but from a from a um, new material perspective, I think we've always looked for new materials in the building industry. Um, you know, we're we're always wanting something a bit different, and we always like to um, you know be using materials that make your your street stand out as opposed to your neighbours. You know, you want it to. You, you want the best house in the street. Um, so we've always been like looking for new new products and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure about the, the module yep. home yep, side okay. of things. It's not my area. Paul, what about the um the people that are listening to this? So you've got a you've got a, a bunch of people that just heard what you said. If they're if they're entering into a contract now, going forward, eyes wide open, time frames, costs, all those sorts of things. But there's a bunch of people that are sitting in the messy middle, right? They yeah. They did the fixed price, then then the last two years just happened, and they're kind of at that 
60 70 percent um completion but you've got a builder that's under stress what what's what's the what's the message for i guess everyone right because the builder wants to make a profit and the and the and the person building it wants to do it as cheap as possible but there's got to be somewhere in the middle where is there is how are people going to best give themselves the chance of completing their home given the 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 sandwich that everyone's in uh, should they approach the builder and say listen let's have a conversation where we understand we had a fixed price contract that seems to be a bit of a work of fiction to get it done now if we were to um, talk about um, what it would take if it costs more we'll get the finance here in some cases a lot of people's land values increase um, significantly while they've been waiting um, where where is the arbitration or the 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 way forward for a lot of those people that are just stuck in that that messy space where they can't get their home completed? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really tough, right? So, um, and every situation is different, but I think obviously, um, what you're alluding to is communication is super important. So, you know, if you if you're seeing that the builder's under stress, um, and you can sit down and talk, and you've got a good relationship with the builder, that's that's the starting point, you know, um. And un- also understanding it from the other person's perspective. So the, the builder understanding it from the client's perspective and the client understanding it from the builder's perspective. It's going to be um, a lot easier to renegotiate and maybe um, help cover some of the costs that the builders incurred to keep that builder on your project to get it completed rather than that builder going broke halfway through the job and then you're You've got to go to your insurance company and then you've got to find another builder to take over that project halfway through. The new builder coming in gets to requote. That could be exponentially higher than your negotiating costs with your current builder. Um, but it's tough because everyone's doing it hard. And and um, I, I think sitting down with your builder and and also, you know, maybe getting some legal advice as well, you know. Um, mm. You know, you can hold your builder to that contract, but if you send him bro, it's not going to do you any favors in the long run. Hundred percent of zero is still zero. That's that's yeah. the bit here. It's not like the builder is holding out so they can buy another Mercedes. The builder's no, holding right. out so they can keep the, the lights coast. on. <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, it's really important, Bryce, that we double down on this particular message because if someone's sitting there thinking, "Well, I've got a fixed price contract, and I'm going to make sure that that I hold the builder to task," and that builder goes broke. You are miles off where you want to be, yeah. and and as Paul's saying, that that next builder that comes in that picks up half a project, and if that's let's say it lays idle for six months or even longer, you know the the builder might come in and say, wait a minute, I'm not happy with this frame, or there's been too much water that's been sitting on the slab, or whatever. So I'm gonna, you know, there's there's lots of so it becomes an absolute nightmare. So I think to Paul's point, if I can just double click on it, communication. Yeah. Um, between builder and client is really going to be, um, you know, because you, you you are both in this together. Um, and it's just so heartbreaking to see the stories of those people who their builder has gone broke through no fault of their own. And they're ultimately, you know, in this very, very difficult spot, which is probably a, probably a part of what you were just saying before, Paul, about the insurances that you can get so can you tell, do you, I mean, it's not your area of expertise, so I want to put a qualification on that, but tell me about the types of insurance that you should get as a starting point when you're potentially going into a contract with a builder. Well, the builder needs to organise those insurances. So it's builder's warranty insurance. Um, um, and so what happens is if the builder goes broke, I've actually got um, a, a close friend of mine who who um, I worked with for many years. He was in exactly this situation. So he... Um, had a number of projects going on, um, escalation of prices, just put him in a position where he was borrowing money against his own home to try and finish these projects. And it just got to the point where he couldn't borrow any more money and the, the pressure got to him. So he actually went to the clients and, and sat down with them and said, I'm struggling, I'm not going to get this finished. But what I do want to do is work with you to get it to a point. So during a build, there's a number of stages that um, the building surveyor comes in and checks off. So, you know, frame stage, lock up, fix. So he worked with a number of those people to get those buildings to lock up stage so that it was a smoother transition to another builder. They're not coming in halfway through a frame being built. You know, the building surveyor has signed it off saying that it's all to, you know, building code and all of that sort of stuff. So um, 
the insurance then the the person that um this particular instance the they went to their insurer and the insurer come in and actually did an audit on the um on the property and they actually got a payout to help finish that project but it still left them behind they still had to put in more money to to get that finished and to find another builder and there's a there's a huge lag time as well if you've ever dealt with an insurance company it doesn't happen overnight so if you're calling your insurance company and you're thinking oh it's fine i've got builder's warranty insurance and i'll, I'll be able to just you know get that going it could be months before you start building again once they go through that process and you engage another builder and you start that and outside of that you've got all your living costs as well you know you might be renting another property that you're having to you know pay for and you've got your mortgage that you're paying for and it's just you know one after another so um legal advice is probably the the, the way to go to to speak to someone about you know what your rights are with your insurance company and all that sort of stuff but certainly negotiating with your builder and trying to to um navigate it that way would be the first way the first thing to have yeah. a crack at i reckon a yeah, good tip. So I, I guess to flesh that out a little further, you just talked about your friend who tried to get it to a nice handover point. But what, uh, and even at that or even a little earlier, how, how does it work with defects and uh, warranties and structural guarantees? And like, how do, how do you, where does that transfer? How, how So if someone's in this situation and yep. they've, they've got a frame that's been out in the weather, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, and all of a sudden it's handed over, where does the baton change and what happens on the previous builder and the new builder? Can you yeah. sort of give us some well, insight there? Well, it depends on where the project got to before before the first builder bowed out. So um, if all the structural components are done, um, and this is not my, again, this is not my area of expertise, but my, my understanding is that, you know, like if um, all the structural components are done and it's at lockup, for example, then the warranty insurance that the builder took out originally would cover that part of the build and then the builder coming in he would need to do all his checks and he would need to sit down with the building surveyor and make sure that you know everything was signed off and and done to code and all that sort of stuff and then he would continue the work from from that point um but every case is a little bit different you know it depends where the where the actual construction stopped and, and to, to what point so um the, the good thing about um the building industry is that we have the the builder and we have the client but um overseeing the whole thing is the building surveyor so they're independent and they come out and they make sure that the work is done to a to a standard at at each stage throughout the build so you know hopefully when you get to that frame stage and it's signed off the building surveyor can confidently say look all the footings were done correctly um you know all the appropriate structural steel was in place you know the frame was built to code so that there should be a level of comfort for the new builder coming in but it's always a risk taking over someone else's work. That it is. And, and so obviously the next logical question is, is this a good time to be looking to, to build or renovate, Paul? Um, I think I think it is. Um, only because if you're getting something quoted that um that you've provided a builder, you know, in the last period of time, they're understanding what what things cost now. So you'll get a you'll get a uh, a quote or an estimate based on today's prices. So if you're building, you know, you still need to do your due, due diligence on your builder. Um, you, you need to make sure you've got contingency there. But, you know, if you're in a position to renovate or build, I don't see it changing anytime soon. Do you see uh, more failures? I mean, let me just give you some context here. So I was on the phone to a friend of mine who's in WA, um, and I'm not going to announce the industry association, but he's in the building trade. And he works for one of the associations and their fear over there is that a third, and I, and I don't want to create a panic here, but um, a third of the builders over there, he's anticipating and they're preparing for them to go broke because of the lag element. So I think what you're saying is right about these new quotes, but all of the, all of the quotes that are in the system, they're basically building them at losses. And so there is potentially risk in the system. Now, why is that interesting? Because my, my mum and dad were telling me about it, family friends who are moving from Yarrawonga and they're going to live with family friends in WA and they've just signed a, you know, or about to sign a $500,000 building contract. And I just went, can you just make sure that the builder's um, financially secure? Can you ask for a bit of extra information? Because these are people in their late 70s, you know, potentially early 80s, right? So 
that to go for them, you know, in terms of, you know, this lifestyle that they're trying to to rebuild over could be problematic for them only because I knew I had this other little bit of intelligence that was coming in from the side because how do you, how, I mean, what are, what are some of the things that you might want to ask your builder um, about their level of financial stability? Is there is there any type of questions or or things you should be asking? Uh, look, I'm, I'm not really sure, but, you know, certainly yeah. asking how many projects they've got on the go at the moment, um, yeah. what stage those projects are at. You know, look, if, if they've got, I'm talking about small builders, if they've got 15 projects on the go and they're all in the early stages, you know, like how are they how are they managing yeah. those those bills? Managing cash flow, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I'm not really sure how you get reassurance from a builder, um, you know, again, that, I'm, I'm just not sure, to be honest. No, that's a fair, well, it's it's tough, right, because, again, I mean, you're obviously not building as much these days or not building at all you, you know, on the inspection side, but it just goes to show you that, unfortunately, it's not a perfect world that we're living in. The insurances and communication and that type of thing is the essential piece here in terms of, you know, you people want to get on with their lives. They want to start new lives. They want to build their dream homes. You know, they're trying to create their lifestyle by design, but we're just in what Bryce said before about this messy middle bit. We're mm. in this sort of, uh, this period of uncertainty. And and that's why I'm saying I don't want to create any further um, uh, fear because what we do need is confidence. So you coming out and saying, now that the, the you know, the quotas and the appraisers have got a good idea of costs, um, it's it, it's less likely that you're going to see a material um, differentiation in that uh, that quote um, that what we have seen in the last twelve months, where it's you know timber prices have gone up thirty six percent, you know brick costs have gone up twenty nine, whatever they are, right? And obviously that's going to be different around the country. But I think it just makes for a good point. But to to your point, you're sort of saying, um, yeah, I, I I really do like that question about how many projects have they got on the go. Um, because that is about how much you know how much cash flow are they going to need to get them through that? What stages are those projects on? And and certainly some of those mass builders, they they also would you know be having a bit of a liquidity crunch, I suspect as well. Absolutely. When you build, when you've got multiple projects on the go, um, talking from experience, my experience, if you've got a number of jobs on the go, you're always sort of. Um, well, not always, but you're sometimes robbing Peter to pay Paul. So you'll get a payment for a job, you know, a frame stage job, and you're using that money to progress the next job along to get to a certain point. So you get that payment and then that payment uses, you use that to buy materials for the next job. And so it is it is a bit of a balancing act. So if you've got too many irons in the fire and, you know, you don't have the, you know, the capacity to deal with that, that that's the big issue, you know, like, yeah. and then you have those escalation in prices that you're talking about and then, the money that you're getting for this stage doesn't cover the next stage and then the money you get for that you're falling behind further and then it just it just escalates to a point where you know you're taking money out of your own mortgage to cover costs and yeah it all just blows up so i've actually i've actually, actually that before when you said it that if, if they're all if you've got 15 projects and they're all at the same stage that that would be a flag versus some at frame some at lock up for the very reason that you just talked about so that that's a little due diligence tip that people can do in there when they're choosing a builder just to just to see what stages all of their projects are currently at for that for yep. that cash flow reason. The other thing you can um you can check on a builder's building license as well. So you can go to in Victoria, you can go to the VBA and make and see if there's any um you know disputes against the builder. Like if you know if you jump on the VBA website and and search a builder's builder's license and there's six disputes against them, you're like, mm, what hang on, what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> I need to ask some more questions before we sign a contract. It's an amber flag, isn't it? Hey, yeah. um, you know, in in speaking with this other person who's, whose name is also Paul over in WA, we were talking about what are the release valves. Um, and so one of the ones in terms of how do we, you know, how do we get on top of this? And for me, the most logical one is what you were saying before about uh, not having that a workforce. So immigration in, in terms of bringing in that workforce, not only just the laborers for the site, so the backpackers, but also some of that skilled labor. Yeah. We we need to absolutely make sure, and the government needs to make sure that we're building, they're bringing in heaps of chippies, sparkies, you know, plumbers, tilers, all of the fundamental type thing, because that that's what we were talking about. We were talking about that the price quoted on those jobs were moving from sort of 
um, you know, up to $55 an hour for basic trades, which meant that you're charging them out at sort of $95 an hour. Now, $95 an hour, as opposed to what you would be charging that out three or four years ago was probably $60, $65 an hour. So it just gives you an idea that those costs are material, you know, in that sort of 20 to 30% range. The other side to that is good staff is your business. So if you've got good staff that produce good work, the end result ends up being a really good product that you supply your client. So if you get good staff, you've got to keep them. And to keep them, you've got to incentivize them because there's lots of work out there at the moment. So, yeah. you know, if you've got a if you've got a good small business and you've got good staff, it's costing you to keep those staff. Yep. That's a good point. Yeah. How do the how do the how do the builders, um, uh, small and medium builders, compete with the volume builders because of the fact that they, if we've if got limited um, uh, limited supply of materials, I'd, I'd imagine that the people with the big accounts are, are front of the queue, yep. and the people who, without the big accounts are second and third in line. So, yeah. how much of an impact does that have on when someone who's um, making a decision? I I get this is a bit of you know ask a barber if you need a haircut because for you it, you know I know that you're um, I know your work is um, bespoke and so therefore you're not a volume builder, but for people who are trying to, to get access to it in the current times, they've, it's got to be something they're thinking about in terms of who's getting the materials first. Yeah, so um, firstly, small builders don't compete with volume builders. We just can't. We do different types of work. Um, but uh, uh, there's one big um, hardware store that supplies the industry that I know that actually went back and they rated their credit history. So if you were a builder, didn't matter what size you were, if you were a builder that got your invoice for, for the previous month and you paid on time every time and you've got a really good history of payment and all of that sort of stuff, and there was a limited stock of material on there, what they did was they actually graded you A, B, C, and D. And if you're an A client that paid your bill on time every month in full, you would be first to get the materials when you, when you pulled up. If you're a D client and they were con constantly chasing you for money and you know, you're a bad payer and you're calling up and say, oh, I need another 30 days. Can you give me another 30 days on this money? Then you'd be the last in line to get those materials. Darnly fair, really. I think that, I mean, and I suppose those volume builders also pay on 90-day terms or 120-day terms, right? So that's that's probably a, a good win for the, the small, medium-sized enterprise to basically be treated with a little bit of respect and, and valued by as you say, that particular, you know, um, hardware chain or supplier, yep. I think that's 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 nice. I think that that's a good news story for those people who are, you know, doing the right thing. It doesn't rewarded. necessarily mean that the volume builders miss out though, because if they're paying on time, correct, um, they, they yeah, may yeah. still have an, an A. So, but if their yeah. terms are 120 days versus the terms of the small guys on, you know, he's on 14 days or cash on delivery, um, you know, that's probably where it does become interesting. I think it's hard to compare a volume builder who builds hundreds of homes a year to a builder that does two or three at a time that yep. is going into your, you know, your, you know, your local hardware store to pick up materials and all that sort of stuff. So it's it, it's apples and oranges to be honest. Yeah, but um, but yeah, the you know suppliers are actually um, sort of rating customers and um, dealing with people that pay and and do the right thing. Well, transparency is the issue there, isn't it? For the for the for the person trying to sign a building contract, they don't know that it's obviously yep. an industry thing and a and a um, I guess a um, get in the front of the line thing. Hey, um, just anecdotally for you, um, Paul, you, you know you've 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 declared this is not your expertise, but um, <laughs> uh, recently had a um a scenario where a person was building a house. Um, the builder got their um license suspended, um, mm. but but they needed to be insolvent before they could claim on insurance. And and so suspended can't proceed, not yet proven to be insolvent. There was this little gap in the middle where um, uh, the, the buyer was left uh, with, with a bit of a challenge. So anecdotally more than anything, but I'm not sure if there's anything you can add to that. It's just, just one of those little yeah. um, niche technicalities that um, make people a little bit weary of what's going on right now. Yeah, it's a tough situation. Um I don't know how you deal with that. I would be I would be suggesting to to any of my clients to go and seek some legal advice. What 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 happened there? Like that's exactly what that's exactly the situation. They're yeah, in they're in legal gone. advice territory right now. Yeah. Um to 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 try and get some form of resolution so that they 
um, so that they can move on. So um, interesting, interesting for them, which is yeah. which is which is a challenge all around. Yeah, there's so really people doing it really tough at the moment. Yeah, there are. Now, look, what what I want to do is let let's talk about normal then. So that's what I'm sort of saying. So before I were talking about where, where's the pressure valve, it's definitely on obviously more trades coming through. So that's not only from immigration, but hopefully also, you know, those, uh, you know, sort of apprentices that are coming through the system as well. That's hopefully going to to do that as well. Um, I want to, when we talk about materials, Paul, um, we, we heard about obviously timber shortages um, and what was the, was, was there a brick shortage at any point? I, did, I don't think I remember a brick shortage. There's a brick a, layer shortage. Brick layer shortage. Thank you. So, so uh, are we starting to see some signs about, you know, sort of timber at the moment is actually um, accessible and, you know, electrical wiring and all of that sort of stuff? Is there any sort of lag stuff that you're still hearing out in the market about materials that, in terms of accessing them at the moment? Yeah. So you started that question with getting back to normal. The definition <laughs> the of normal, normal, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the world has changed. <laughs> but... um. Look, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that there's more material on shelves going into hardware stores at the moment. So um, that, that sort of suggests that um, the supply chain issues are being dealt with. Um, I do know that, um, and, and again, just this is just based on my Anecdotal. experience. Yep. Um, you know, used to uh, send a set of plans off to a, like a window and a door manufacturer and it would be, they would quote that and it'd be six weeks turnaround before you get those windows once you actually paid your deposit and had it organised. It's now 15 weeks, 14 or 15 weeks before you get those windows. So what's happening is builders are needing to be more organised and, and ordering them much earlier now. So the other thing that's happening, in, and I'm just using windows and doors as an example, you know, if you've got a, a $40,000 window order for, a, for a, a renovation extension or, or new build, whatever it might be, they're actually asking for a much larger deposit because they're worried about builders going broke. That there is also putting stress on the builder because they can't go to the client and say, hey, can I have some more money because I've got to pay this deposit to the window company? So there's all these little things that are happening yeah. behind the scenes for the builder that um, that the client doesn't know about. And it's not the client's issue at all. But, um, you know, there, there is a lag and then there's, there's changes in the way all the suppliers are running their businesses to protect themselves, which is fair enough. Um, so, again, I, I, I kind of think that, you know, the industry really needs to be looked at, you know, from from the highest level Top and um, look at how these contracts work and, and how we're, you know, ha- how it's all structured, to be honest. And it's really tough. Sounds like, the building in- Sorry. <laughs> well, sounds like the building industry's got their own toilet paper issue. Everyone's just worried that it's going to run out. So they keep getting more and more. And so they're pushing it out. And because they've got 15 week lead times, so they get it in and just sorts to become uh, self-fulfilling, doesn't it? But um, mm. hey, if we could pivot, because there is a backstory with um, uh, you as a builder, but that's not your main game now. I'd love to find out what Ben was like as a, as a client, but we might do that off. <laughs> yeah, might, that might be average. We might, we might do that <laughs> Well, we're still talking to each other, so communication was yes, the key. Communication. It, it did happen over important. a beer but, or um, two, but we can... <laughs> Ben doesn't struggle with a chat either, by the way. Oh, mate, 416 episodes. I've got to wait for him to get a breath in. So just like you're preaching to the choir here. But um, uh, but he's often got very good things to say. I'm sure you'd agree. But, um, yeah. uh, on, on the on – the, do you want to write a reply, Ben? I can see you getting fidgety. <laughs> no, no, I'm all good. <laughs> um, so on, on the inspection front, um, you spend a lot of time going out uh, on behalf of the buyers uh, with your business at Inside Out Property Inspections where you're going and doing it on behalf of, of the buyer. So it'll be interesting to see um, – if we slightly pivot from from the challenges of actually starting from scratch, from from what you see in terms of a maintenance um, perspective for people buying, or whether or not it's a reason why they should proceed or not proceed, um, what 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 are you seeing? Is there any is there any uh, is there anything um, that's standing out from you um, over the last twelve months, or is it sort of similar um, defects that you've been seeing from a from a longer run up than that? Yeah, so um, a bit of an observation about. Um, purchasing homes that one of the big things that I've seen over the last period of time is properties that are fully renovated or fully completed with nothing to do I find they're still selling quite well and mm. and at a good price at a reasonable price point based on everything else that's happening in the world 
but the old um you know renovators delight is scaring a lot of people off so you know people don't know how much things are going to cost they don't know whether they're going to be able to find the right trades or a builder to do the work and i feel like that they're the properties that are struggling but having said that if you've got a a certain type of a skill set and are prepared to roll your sleeves up. I reckon there's some really good opportunities out there for people to, um, you know, to, to get in there and do that. But um, that, that's what I'm finding, you know, like the properties that are, that are fully done, nothing to, nothing to do are still selling really well. Um, from a, from a defects point of view, water's an issue at the moment with the amount of rain that we've had over, you know, the last period of time. We've had more rain, you know, this year, and just just from a working perspective, we've been rained off jobs more in the last six months than we have in the last six years. So mm. um, there's there's lots of water around. Um, people are finding that site drainage, we're struggling with site drainage with, with the amount of water. Um, one of the big things is we don't want water sitting at the base brickwork or, or being able to run underneath your house. It, it causes all sorts of issues. So um, water is a big one. If 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 there's anything to maintain on your house, it's the flow of water, whether it's a leaking gutter or a downpipe that's not connected or, you know, land falls back towards your house and you find the water's ponding up against the brickwork or running under the house or you've got a leaking tap. They're the sorts of things that you want to get onto, you know, straight away because they cause bigger problems down the road. And a lot of times it's it's re- relatively easy to fix if you get it early. Yeah, good advice there. Um Interesting your observation around the renovators delight too, because it, it sort of changes the uh, the buyer's decision quadrant too, Ben, for some people, because they, you know, they compromise on all things except for that. But if they if they don't have the confidence around um getting the renovations done, that'll that'll change. But I, I think people can put themselves into different categories, right? Whether it's I need to do something now versus I need to do something um uh, a little bit in the future. From my own personal experience, we were we were looking to uh, knock down a house and and rebuild our dream home and based on everything that was happening we we shelved that it's it's still part of the plan we put a tenant in that property uh we actually um moved to another one um and paul's very aware of those because he was the inspector ben um of the the ones that i purchased but um i guess if people are in a, pos- a position where they can actually um defer so, so still see the opportunity because you're right there is opportunity now as long as they have the ability to fund some of the um, additional ongoing costs that come from that, because you're not a you're not fixing it straight away, and b they often come up with a bit more maintenance that you got to factor in, given all of the other pressures that are going on in your household right now. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, this is where again, when other people are fearful, this is where opportunity lives. Mm-hmm. So you know, I, I was you know Paul and I were chatting the other Sunday, and we were having a chat as we were driving to sort of say. I, I get that. I mean, like, so all of these sort of doer uppers and renovators delights and and we're also hearing anecdotally in terms of dealing with our agents um, out in the field that they're sort of saying that some of the properties are actually being sold by investors. And we're seeing that coming up in the data where there's less and less rental properties coming to market. The compliance cost or the, you know, to build it up to specs of what it needs to be, the investors sort of saying, well, if, if property prices are going down, because they've got the blinkers on on this short-term story. If they actually lifted their eyes and said, well, is it, you know, is it livable now? Is it safe for a tenant? I think, you know, if I was going to be looking to buy, those renovators are like where you talk about turning apple into apple pie. This is the best time, you know, when, you know, because because ultimately there will be, uh, and to Paul's point, there will be a new norm. Okay, mm. so we're not going to see property, we're not going to see material costs and those type of things go back down where they were, but we will see labour costs settle down somewhat. Um, and so over time, it's like there will be a time where um, doing those renovations and doing those those uh, additions can actually add value Mm -hmm. and at you know whereas you know we talked about in the past where you sort of say good rule of thumb for an investor is one dollar down for a two dollar reval well that wouldn't be happening at the moment right in terms of the cost of that you're not necessarily going to see that showing up in the revaluation of the property but properties are a long-term investment don't try and speculate but if you can get something that's got good bones that allows you to then sort of say okay cosmetically I can do some improvements down the track, but this will rent out comfortably today when there is a crisis in the rental market. So you're going to be then sit on it. In a, in a sense, land back in with income is the story here for, for those types of people. So 
I don't know whether you've got anything more to add to that, Bakes, but, you know, that's the way I see it is if, you know, to your point, if you're handy or if you want to roll your sleeves up, um, you know, and if you're a first time buyer who wants to get into a better market, a closer in market or whatever that looks like, this is the time where there's not much competition on those properties, you know, because in a sense, they're being judged as B and C grade properties. But ultimately, you know, with a bit of finesse, um, they could move up to B or A grade type properties because they're in the right location. They're just tired. Yeah. Well, tell me about properties that are close to the city and how they can continue to increase in value. So if you can land bank something for a couple of years, you get a bit of uh, capital growth in that property. You go back to the bank and borrow a bit of money. All of a sudden, yeah. you know, you've got this beautiful home in a great location with a bit of hard work. And you're hearing at the coalface, Ben, that there's an opportunity. So uh, yeah. <laughs> because it's not the uh, it's not the flavour of the moment at, that uh, at present, which is um, which is interesting. So, uh, Paul, the final question I have for you is: um, in the building inspection space, um, uh, not not all inspectors are created equal. <laughs> So if someone if someone's looking to to engage um, both the building inspector and you're you're also a uh, a pest inspector also, um, what should people be thinking about um, to engage people that give them the best opportunity to a find out if there is any issues um, uh, with with the property, but b make sure that they're using um, professionals who are qualified and experienced for the role. Yeah. So um, in terms of pre purchase. Um, it's not a regulated industry in Victoria. So, um, you know, you could have a plastering background or, you know, a different sort of trade background and um, get into the industry. Where it changes and what consumers should be thinking about or clients should be thinking about is asking some questions of your building inspector if, you, if you're on the phone or you find someone on Google. You want to know that they're insured, firstly, first and foremost. If they don't have insurance, put down the phone and pick up and try another inspector. Um, the other can thing, that be verified um, independently? Sorry? Can that be verified on any yeah, websites? Yep. A, a, well, you can you can ask for a, a copy of the certificate of currency. Sure. Yep. yep. Um, uh, and the other thing is um, with standard wording in contracts, if you send a um, uh, an inspector out to have a look at a property and they find a major defect, which you know a major structural defect, which would be cause to pull out of the contract. The standard wording in the contract, if they're not a registered building practitioner or an architect um, or better, like a building surveyor, for example, the vendor's conveyance or a lawyer can not accept that report. So we've had instances where um, we've had people call up and say, oh, I've had an inspector go out, they found this, um, but the conveyancer for the vendor is not accepting it. And we've had to go out and do the same report. The information was generally pretty good in the report, but because they weren't a registered building practitioner, the vendors conveyance that didn't accept that report. So we had to do a second report. Um, and obviously, you know, we had to charge for our time. So the, the client was paying for that report twice. Mm -hmm. So um, what I would suggest, you know, if you if you're looking for a building inspector to do a pre-purchase building inspection, you want to make sure that they've got insurance. You want to make sure that they're at least a registered building practitioner. Um, and similarly on the um pest side of things, you want to make sure that there are registered um, pest controller in Victoria. Because if you, if they were to find a, a pest infestation, same deal, the, the conveyancer can just knock back that report and then you need to go and find someone to uh, to go and do that. So if, you, if you've missed that point, let's play that out again. You, you're about to negotiate on a property and you're going for, say, uh, building and pest inspection uh, terms, and you're also going for, say, maybe subject to finance. Now, usually they have a deadline on them. Um, let's call it 10 days to get that organized. So you as the the, the buyer, you then, you know, Google, uh, you know, building inspector in your local area. And if you don't ask those two questions that Paul was referring to, you go out and get the cheapest guy on the street, um, you know, and it could also be part of a franchise group um, or a bigger, larger group, but you've got to ask the question if they're not that, i.e., if those people have bought a franchise because they were a plasterer beforehand, so they know builds, but they don't necessarily, their, their report doesn't stack up. And then you submit that on day nine of, um, and then you want to pull out of the contract because there's a material, a structural defect in the property. You, you know, and and their lawyers push back on you, if you don't get that right report in their hands in that time, effectively, they if they want to play hardball with you, they can force you to complete on that contract. 
So two things, two things wrong here, you know, obviously, well, one, you've now bought a dud and you're going to have to fix it. But two is you, you could have, you could have double fees. So it's a little tip for beginners in terms of this space is to always go for your licensed professionals. And in this case, you know, what we're talking about is, is that uh, registered builder. Um, what's the terminology, uh, Paul? Registered building practitioner. There's the, there's the right terminology. So good, good, good little tip there. Yeah, uh, very good. Some good, some great tips there, mate. I think that's, uh, I think that's been super helpful for for a bunch of reasons. But it gives people a, an idea of, you know, they hear some headlines around what the industry. It sounds like that is a product of a uh, of an unprecedented, messy time that it's starting to find its own water finds its own level. So it's starting to see that for people that are moving forward. Two, if someone does find themselves in the in the messy middle, it's it's really time to take some legal counsel on that just to see because um, everyone's goal is to finish and it's also, you know, it's the builder's goal to finish too. In some cases, they might not be able to. Um, and also you've given our listeners a great little tip that if if cash flow allows and time horizon allows, there is a sector of the market right now around that renovator's delight where where opportunity exists for people that, um, that have the circumstances that allow um, allow them to do that. So, um, mate, that's that's been super insightful, and um, uh, mate, we've had a, we've had a Ben's had a relationship with you for many years, but uh, I've known you for a, quite a number of years too, and um, your work is is incredible, and and your insights have been wonderful for us and our team. So, mate, on behalf of everyone here at the Property Couch, mate, thanks thanks for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Love it, and just remember, inside out property inspections. If I'm allowed to give a little. Uh, little plug in there for you and Russ as well. That's us. <laughs> Details will be in the show notes. Thanks again, Paul. Well, mate, that was an interesting chat. I know there's uh, there's a lot of history between the two of you, but um, there, there's been a lot of professional work that we've done with Paul over many, many years. And I think it's because of his, his insights. He's got that fine blend between technical craft. And uh, in that interview, we talked about communication and that's something that um, that we do value that, uh, that we get to have with him. And you could see the insights that he was able to share and hopefully that's helped people understand not only uh, behind the curtain on what's going on, but what's actually going on for people who find themselves in situations where they need to move forward. Um, how can they, how can they uh, negotiate to find a win-win for everyone so that everyone gets what they want and that's their, their roof over their head, their dream home so they can start building some memories. So good conversation, Ben. Yeah, terrific. And obviously, yeah, you know, the reason why Paul's so respected is because he is a good communicator and obviously good communication married with great experience is why he and Russ, he's uh, the other uh, member of the team, uh, are so good at what they do with their years of experience and, you know, helping people, you know, make the right right choices. So that's why I'm a big fan, but he's also a, a cracking fella um, yeah. when we're not talking work as well. Yeah. Even and he's uh, a rich uh, supporter. <laughs> Hey, I missed that. Even though he's a Richmond supporter, he's still a cracking <laughs> fella. What a nice one. I like it. Hey, um, and just a timely reminder of the number one enemy of all property, and that's water. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the country's had a little bit of it of late. So um, just to make sure that we're doing maintenance around that number one em- enemy so that we can be proactive and looking out for that. So um, yep. good insights. Hopefully that's been helpful. If that If that did help you folks and you know someone, who's currently experiencing um, challenges in the building industry or you know someone who you think would have a, a benefit from understanding what's currently going on, we'd encourage you to screenshot and share it on where you share or just uh, uh, mention to someone in the workplace or you know in your, in your social networks just to check out the episode because I, I think it was a ripper and I think it uh, would be helpful for a lot of people. So um Thanks again, Paul. We appreciate your insights. Hey, my life hack today, Ben, is um, consumption versus learning. I've been um, been listening to some stuff of late, and I've been I've been challenged by this concept. I've been thinking about it a lot, and it applies to something that um, you sent me during the week as well. But um, if you hear something new, the key is to apply it. Right, that's nothing new here. But but here's a different way to look at it. When faced with the the same set of circumstances, if you change your behaviour based on the learning. Uh, sorry, based on the information, then, then that's the definition of learning. But if if there's no behavior change, it's just consumption. And I think that's I think that's a mm-hmm. challenge. It hit, hit me between the eyes because I like to read, I like to consume a lot of stuff, but I've actually had to think about that in terms of my own life because clearly in some spaces I 
I I make behavior change a lot, but in other places, it's just information that's rattling around the back of my head. So, um, so I, I'm in a lot of areas a victim of the consumption. So I've been putting this, I've been putting this front of mind for me. I've been thinking about how I can do that. And I want to challenge our community to do the same. You sent me a podcast on the weekend, um, and you said, "Hey, listen, there's a point from this timestamp that I really want you to dial in on, but have a listen to the whole lot." And I did. I listened to the whole lot. But then I thought to myself, this was rattling around in the back of my head. And normally what I would do is I'd consume the information, stick it in my head, see if I can process it. But there's 100 million messages that are going on at any one time. So I actually took the time to write it down. I wrote down what the notes were that I got from the um, from the podcast. The main concept that you were talking to me about, I was started thinking about how, how can I actually see that and how does that actually affect behavior change for me so that it actually is... Um, some learning, but it also gave me a reference to easy go back and go, what what were the key things that I was chatting about? So my life hack today is, is the same to people listening to this. Are you a consumer or are you a learner? Because I I identify Ben as a as a learner, um, but I was challenged by that. Maybe, maybe in some areas I must identify well, I probably more identify with a consumer than a learner. Um, so I want I want that to land for everyone. Well, it's, it's getting hard, isn't it, right? Because there's mm. so much content, there's so mm. much information out there and so many frameworks and processes and all that type of stuff. What I find myself doing is when something does come across my ears and my eyes, I do exactly what you just said. So I've written down, you know, so I, I send an email to myself. Mm. I actually send an email that goes into a different, you know, inbox. And ultimately, I can come back and refresh on that as well. So I did exactly that. But it, it's only, you know, and then sometimes you're ready for, to consume it. And other times, you just got to let it pass. Because if here is the challenge, right? It is about how do you make those judgment calls, the trade-offs of what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Mm. And so sometimes you just got to say, oh, I'm going to come back for that. And you just let it go. But you are, you are, you know, you're ingesting it some way, whether it hits you straight away and you need to act on it which is what what your sort of big point here today is, is, is exactly that. As soon as I heard that, and this is from several years ago, I'm like, oh, man, that makes a lot of good sense to me at this point in time. So I'm just going to take some notes on that so, so it doesn't just go in one ear and out the other. So there you go. It was a Tim Ferriss podcast, Ben. It was um, Jim Collins, uh, good to great for anyone who was interested. Yeah. Um, it was it was more the context um, for business building than it was for investing. So yeah. um, there was no major investing insight. But... Ben, Jim, Jim Rohn um, was uh, one of my favourite uh, early um, virtual mentors and he had this concept here of the, of the journal. I'm showing you on screen. No one who's oh, listening yes. can see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's a leather bound um, that I can get from his website and it costs, I think it costs me about 35 bucks or maybe even 40 bucks and I've got to get it sent from the States and it's an empty page, right? But I challenge myself to fill it with enough content that makes it worth the because I could go to Officeworks and buy one for five bucks. Yeah. Um, but all of these concepts in here are absolutely life-changing stuff that I'll hear on a podcast or I'll read it on a book or I'm sitting there watching YouTube or something like that. And what I did is I actually summarized the conversation um in that podcast oh, so nice. that I actually had had the key things. And then what happens is I just grab this book and I just riff through some stuff because it actually then helps me with the concept that I'm talking about in this life hack around yeah. learning. Because here, here it is again. If you've received some information and then faced with the same set of circumstances in the future, based on the information you receive, does your behavior change? And if your behavior doesn't change, it was consumption, it wasn't learning. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I, that's, a, that's a little one. I've shared that with you before, Ben. But the book feels good. It gives me inspiration to fill it with stuff that's actually worthwhile. And I can promise you that the concepts that are in this little book here are life-changing concepts as you flash up your red one with the same thing. Yeah, so, I've got a red one and a blue one <laughs> so, <laughs> with the same the principles. Same. Yep. There we go, folks. Something for you to listen. Ben and I are lifelong uh, learners. Um, we're implementing some of these tips. But the important thing is we got to check ourselves too to see if we're consumers or if we're learners. Um based on whether we've implemented. Hey, Ben, what's making property news? Well, Bryce, this one came out uh, around late October, but I thought I'd circle back to it because, uh, you know, there's a couple of themes in here that I want to quickly talk to. But the, the, it was an REA article, so realestate.com.au, and it says um, what it will cost you to live in Australia's most expensive suburbs. Sort of a game building on some themes that we're going to come back to in a couple of weeks' time. 
but it's effectively um, so prop track, which is owned by um, realestate.com.au or REA group um, has an automated valuation modeling tool, the AVM we call it in the industry. And so it uses basically data and machine learning and, and algorithms in terms of hedonic uh, measurements to try and detect uh, property values, right? And it, it obviously goes through and, and revalues every property like our good friends at Core Logic do. Now there are 88 suburbs, Bryce, Mm-hmm. where the median house price is now over $3 million. Now, if you just go back as to our community and sort of remember about, you know, sort of the early 2000s when we were talking about, oh, man, these properties are worth a million dollars. Like, isn't that amazing? Like a million-dollar house and now we've got these properties that, you know, 88 suburbs because they say now there's 10 suburbs across our city or now there's 15 suburbs across our city with a million-dollar price tag. Now we're talking about suburbs with $3 million price tag. Yeah. So you can see where I'm going with this. Now, the number one, so obviously, because that's, you know, everyone wants to know what the number one was, that was Bellevue Hill in mm. Sydney, right? Mm. And it and it has obviously it has suburbs. It is uh, the median AVM valuation in that suburb is $8.42 million. Mm. So not $3 million, $8.42 million in terms of all the time. Now it has the quadrella Bryce. When you t- when you're talking about the living quadrella, this Ooh. is what we're talking about. You're ready for it. Yeah. It has world class real estate tick. It has priceless views tick. tick. It has convenient in its location to yeah. obviously the commerce center, which I'll talk more about in a couple of weeks. And it has prestigious schools. Ooh. So if you're talking about the ultimate lifestyle location, mm. if you have if money is not a problem for you, um, imagine that, keeping up so with the Joneses in that uh, suburb. Ben, you buy something for three point five million, you go, "How good am I?" And they go, "No, nah, mate, <laughs> yeah. you're miles away. You're miles out. You're miles." Away. Now, but people might be saying, "Well, wait, wait, wait. What about Point Piper?" Like, because technically, there's the hundred million and the 70, 71 million dollar sale from the boys at Lassian. But the point being is, because there's not statistically reliable or enough of those absolute elite properties, um, houses don't fall into the top ten just on account basis in terms of um, for statistical reliability. Mm. However, Bryce, in reading further in the article, units in Point Piper, units in Point Piper make the overall top ten. Wow. Right, with the unit yes. value, the ABM <laughs> top 10 unit value in Point Piper is a lazy $5.2 million yes. price in terms yes. of so number 10 nationally. So they go on because I, I won't keep going because I know, you know, obviously I talk too much, but let me just read out these top <laughs> 10. Right, just for so Bellevue Hill, Vaucluse, Dover Heights, Double Bay, Rose Bay, Longville, uh, Palm Beach, Mossman, Bronte and Point Piper units, right, mm. that make out the top 10. So all in Sydney, um, uh, we obviously have, you know, Turak in Melbourne, um, Port City are those two in there, and we can go around the country. But Pepper we'll put McGrove, a link in the show notes McGrove. because we'll give credit to all of those, yes, in terms of uh, Pepper McGrove, that's right. But here's here's the other little interesting thing. If you've been in your media cycle and you've been reading all the news about property prices falling. They won't, um, go, they won't have gone up, surely, Ben. Oh, you wouldn't have thought so now that sort of Sydney's given back 10% price. But yeah. if you actually look at the quarter on quarter change based on prop tech's data, mm. you see that Bellevue Hill actually scraped out a 0.45 increase mm. quarter on quarter and is 13.17% higher over the year. We have Vaucluse 2.5% growth in the quarter. 13.22% over the year. Dover Heights, 3.86% growth in the quarter, 12. 12.04, 12.01% growth over the year. And there is only one area. One uh, gone backwards. Sorry, so, well, one, sorry, my bad. One that's got a material correction in the housing market, that's Palm Beach, a negative uh, 3% for the quarter. And for the year-on-year change, a negative 0.52 of 1%. So basically flat over the year. And then we've got, um, in terms of point piper units, negative 3.68 for the quarter and flat for basically the 12 months. So, And that's the unit market. So here we go where, the, and it's very true, it's very true, you'll hear plenty of commentators and the data suggest that the top 25% quartile is the most volatile and it's giving up the biggest corrections. But have a look at these prestigious locations, right? 
And then have a look at the long-term growth, which we'll, we'll come back to um, in a couple of weeks' time in terms of sending that message. So what's my overall message here? Yeah, what's the takeaway, man? Markets within markets is always what you've got to think about. And then if we're going to be playing the decades game, which is what we want to be doing in terms of long-term property investing, then you want to be looking at these types of economic drivers. You want to be looking at these trade centers, these centers of commerce is the clue I'm giving you away mm. here in terms of the flywheel that I'm going to share in a couple of weeks' time. So just a little bit of food for thought for everyone. Food for thought. I like it, Ben. That's good. Thanks for sharing what's making property news. All right, Ben, we've covered a fair bit today. A uh, very special show. Thanks again to our guests. We've got another guest next week, Ben, uh, covering a topic around deposits. Um, oh, which... so trying to get into the property market with the mm. biggest barrier being deposits. Yes. That sounds like a very interesting show. For all of our firsties. For that, it's going to be a ripper bait. But uh, until next week, Ben. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. Heard it here first, folks. See you next week. Hey guys, Bryce here again. Just want to catch you before you go and let you know if you're new to our community, there are a lot of episodes to catch up on, but it's really important that you start from the very beginning at episode number one. Because episode one through to 20 share all of the foundational pillars and frameworks that you need to know to get the best out of listening to this podcast. So I'd recommend that you start there. And the little tip is to maybe start on one and a half speed. Now, for those of you that are time poor and don't have time to go back from the beginning, don't worry, we've got you covered as well because we've created a binge guide that goes through all of the details and makes it easy for you to read and get up to speed very, very quickly. So if you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash fast track, you will be able to download that binge guide and you will be up to speed in no time. And whilst you're there, I've got a few extra goodies for you because we have our top five frameworks that you'll learn on this podcast, as well as the Make Money Simple Again ebook, which will help you with the foundations of basic money management. So you'll have everything you need to succeed in building your own lifestyle design and getting the best out of this podcast. Now, just a reminder that anything that we cover on this podcast is not considered financial advice. We certainly recommend that you get your unique circumstances looked at by your individual advisor and everything we talk about is just general in nature. But folks, I wanna encourage you again to go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash fast track and you can go and get all those goodies and catch up right away.